uh, thank MSA for hosting this event. And I uh, would like also to thank, thank the speakers for um, uh, giving us this um, uh, interesting event. Um, this event is the third stop of uh, Brother Hamza's tour in Canada, which started this Monday on Hamilton. Uh, he gave a lecture about the um, evidence of prophethood of Prophet Muhammad in uh, McMaster University. And yesterday he was here with us. And uh, today, uh, possibly, is the most interesting event in the tour. Do you agree with me? <laughs> right? We are having Dr. Khalid Suhai, uh, who is uh, actually an ex Muslim and now a secular uh, humanist. And um, Brother Hamza being an ex humanist and now a Muslim, I'm sure this is going to be a very interesting discussion. Tomorrow, Brother Hamza will be in Waterloo University giving uh, a lecture about Islam and reason, friends or foes. And then the last stop of the tour will be in Toronto, York University. Uh, he will be talking about Islam or if he is a. A uh, brief introduction for each of our uh, respecting, uh, respected speaker, Dr. Khalid Suhail. Uh, is a psychiatrist, poet, and writer. He has a wide range of interests and passions. He actually has a lot of uh, publications in, uh, in terms of books, papers, poems, and short stories. One of his books is titled From Islam to Secular Humanism. And another book he actually gave me as a gift. The Next Stage of Human Evolution. So thank you, Dr. Suhail. For more information about Dr. Uh, Suhail, you can visit his website www.drsuhail.com. Uh, our brother Hamza um, is an inter international public speaker on Islam. Um, he regular regularly participates in debates and discussions with um, um, very famous intellectuals and uh, um, speakers all over the world. Um, and the topics include Western and Islamic philosophy and politics. He's also a writer with articles, essays, and commentaries on uh, the same topics. For more information about the writings of Brother Hamza and uh, his debates, you can visit his blog, hamzatwitters.blogspot.com. And Hamza didn't bring me in yet, so we're going to change the format <laughs> of the discussion. In addition to that, he took money from my colleagues, so... <laughs> <laughs> the format for the discussion, we're not going to change it or anything. Uh, uh, we're going to have three sections. Uh, the first section is for introduction. Each of, the speaker will, uh, each of the speakers will have 30 minutes of introduction to introduce their um, uh, view. So, Brother Hamza will be starting by introducing the case for Islam in 30 minutes. Then Dr. Suhail will be uh, introducing the case for secular humanism in 30 minutes. And then the second section for responses. So Brother Hamza will respond to Dr. Suhail's uh, um, introduction in 15 minutes. Then Dr. Suhail will respond in another 15 minutes. After that, we're going to have question and answer sessions. If you would feel more comfortable writing the questions, there are index cards at the table at the back of the room. So if you would like to write them down and pass them, I'll read them for you. Alright, one more thing we need to agree on is the attitude. We are all here to learn. So whatever argument we're going to hear, you can agree or disagree with, you can approve or disapprove, but at the end there is no need to offense. Do we agree on that? Yes. Alright. With that being said, I'll leave the mic to Brother Hansa to start his argument. I'm going to start as Muslims do in the name of God, in Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. 
I greet you all with the examiner greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. For those who don't know what that means, it actually means may the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. Brothers, sisters and friends, I'm very honored to be here in the presence of human beings, first and foremost. Not that I'm using the presence of animals, of course. But I'm also honored to be in the presence of academics, thinkers, aspiring academics and aspiring thinkers. And I think it's very important for us to take a brave step like this, to have these type of discussions, because if we don't know what makes each other distinct, then we will never be able to connect with one another as human beings. If we assume a crude commonality, then you'd be essentially connecting with an image that you have superimposed on another human being. But I think discussions such as today enable us to understand what makes us distinct. If I know what makes you distinct as a human being, with regards to your spiritual, emotional, psychological, psychological, intellectual aspects, then I'll be able to connect with you in ways that I wouldn't have done if I assumed you just like common. I think it's very important for us to consider this and take this deeply into consideration. Today's topic is Islam or secular humanism, which makes more sense. Now, first and foremost, I'm going to suspend my judgment on humanism. I'm going to suspend my judgment on secularism. Because I don't want to build a straw man. I don't know what the doctor is going to talk about today. So in order for us to have a nuanced discussion, I don't want to build up my own perception of what humanism or secularism is. So I'm going to wait for his discussion, then I'm going to adequately respond in a positive way. So what I'm going to do, what my job is today, is essentially to show why Islam makes more sense. And what we mean by making more sense, that it is in line with human reason. It is in line with your logical and rational faculties. This is very important. We don't want to have an emotional argument. Just because we don't like something doesn't necessarily mean it is not true. Because in the 21st century, especially amongst the media and amongst those who like to use outdated cliches and sound bites, it's a world of feeling and emotion. Oh, you guys are mad. You guys are barbaric. How can you do such a thing? Which, in reality, if we reduce this with regards to reason and logic, it doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. Well, it just means that we are not inclined to such a thing. So this is why we need to use our reason, and common sense, our rational faculties, in order to answer today's question. Which one makes more sense? It doesn't mean which one is more practical. It doesn't mean which one do, which one do I like. It doesn't mean which has the greatest sociological benefits. It doesn't mean all these things. It means which one actually agrees with reason and which one agrees with logic. So I'm going to present four key arguments to show that Islam makes sense. For instance, the first argument is going to be the existence of God. The second argument is going to be about the inimitability of the Quranic discourse, which basically means the Quran is a document that cannot be emulated with regards to its unique literary form. Also, my other argument is going to be about religion and God and morality. I'm going to argue that to follow a view that is against a theistic view, we cannot claim our morals to be binding, we cannot claim our morals to have any deeper value or deeper meaning, and we cannot claim our morals to be objective in nature. And I'm going to discuss why. And finally, if we have time, I'm going to discuss Islamic economics to indicate the social political model of Islam is coherent rather than the products of secularism, which some people may argue are liberal economics or capitalism. So let's go straight to the first argument, brothers, sisters, and friends. The existence of God. Now, we have all asked the same questions, okay? Why does something exist rather than nothing? This is not a religious statement. Even the rationalists in our Western tradition, such as Leibniz, he used to say, the first question that should be asked and answered is why does something exist rather than nothing? This is why even the book of the Muslims, the Quran, also says, oh, do they think the universe is 
came into existence out of nothing. Now we could respond to this question by positing a cause for the universe or just saying the universe is uncaused. Let's take the traditional atheist view, which is the universe is a brute fact. Bertrand Russell, the famous atheist philosopher in a radio program in the 60s, he said the universe is just there and that's all. If that's the case, that would mean the universe is infinite. It would mean it had no beginning, no end, and it would therefore imply that the universe has an infinite history of past events. But we know this practically doesn't make any sense. Because the infinity, brothers, sisters, and friends, just doesn't make sense in the real world. Let me give you some examples. Say in this room, we have an infinite number of Hamza Zotis, okay? And if I take 10 Hamza Zotis away, how many Hamza Zotis do we have left? Some people say infinity, other people may say infinity minus 10. Whatever the case may be, we should be able to count how many number of Hamza Zotis down this room, but we can't. It leads to paradoxes and absurdities in the practical world. Let me give you another example. Say we have a hundred Hamza Zotis in this room, and at every possible moment, I add another, another Hamza Zotis. Hamza Zotis 101, Hamza Zotis 102, Hamza Zotis a million one, and so on and so on. Am I ever going to reach an amount of me, okay, that we can describe as infinite? No, because its potential will never be actualized because we could always add another Hamza Zotis. In this slide, mathematicians Kasman and Newman, they said, the infinite certainly does not exist in the same sense that we say they are fish in the sea. Also, we have David Hilbert. He said, the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. So, when we bring this back to the universe, it necessitates that the universe cannot have an infinite history of past events. Therefore, the universe must have had a beginning. If it had a beginning, it logically follows it must have a cause. And this is not just philosophical mumbo-jumbo. This is in line with current astrophysical evidence. For example, the physicist Vilenkin, he said, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. And this is where we could summarize the argument in the following way. One, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore the universe has a cause. It is no wonder P.J. Zwart in his publication about time said, if there is anything we can find inconceivable, is that something could arise from nothing. But all we know from this is as a cause for the universe. It actually describes a God that is aligned with a deist view, not a theistic view. But I would argue, if we use our rational faculties and use conceptual analysis, which basically means, let's think hard about this cause, we will come to the following conclusions. That it must be one. Because if we follow the philosophical principle of Occam's razor, which says, do not multiply entities beyond necessity, then it necessitates that this cause must be one. Because if we say it's two, three, or four, it creates more questions than we could answer, and it provides a more far complex explanation, which in the philosophy of science even means that we reject such an explanation. Also, this cause must be uncaused due to an absurdity of an infinite regress of causes. This cause must be immaterial and transcendent, because since this cause created time and space, it must therefore transcend time and space. Also, this cause must have a will, because if it's an eternal uncaused cause that brought that brought into existence a finite effect, it must have will chosen the universe to come into existence. And choice indicates a will, and a will indicates it can have a relationship with personal agents in the universe. Therefore, brothers and sisters, friends, upon conceptual analysis and the philosophical and rational discussion we've had on the cause of the universe, we could describe what Islam described 1400 years ago in the Quran itself. As the Quran says, say he is God, the one, the only, the eternal, the absolute. He begets not, nor was he begotten, and there is nothing like unto him. So for my reason, and then using our logic and rational faculties, we come to the conclusion that the basic definition of God, as described in the Islamic tradition, is actually reasonable. So let me go to the second argument, the inimitability of the Qur'an. Now the most rational explanation for the fact that no one has been able 
to reproduce the Quranic literary unique form, the structural features of the language, is that it must have come from a transcendent being. It must have come from the divine. Because when we explore the naturalistic explanations for this, we can't find an explanation. So it's a signpost to the supernatural, to the divine. Now, let me give you some historical background. Now, when the Quran came down 1400 years ago, it came down and expressed in a unique form that really challenged the people at the time. Because the people at the time, they were the best at expressing themselves in the Arabic language. They were described as Arabic linguists par excellence. They were the best. This is why the historian Ibn Rashid, he quotes and says that essentially at the time of Arabia, during Revelation, they used to celebrate only on two things, on the birth of a child and when a poet rose amongst them. So it was a socialization of being good at expressing yourself in the Arabic tongue. This is why A.J. Arbery, the famous translator of the Qur'an and the Orientalist, he said, for the Qur'an is neither prose nor poetry, but a unique fusion of both. Also, the Orientalist and British translator, Arbuthnot, he said, although several attempts have been made to challenge the Qur'an, no one has been able to challenge it. And the Qur'an is inimitable. In essence, it cannot be matched because of its unique literary form, as I discussed. Its peak of eloquence, its unique linguistic genre, its abundance of, abundance of rhetorical devices. But you don't have to know anything about it. It's a bit of a technical discussion. But for us, for the layman, for the Westerner who knows nothing about Arabic, can't even recognize Arabic words almost, then how does it make it from the divine? But all we need to use is something called logical deduction. Now, logical deduction is a thinking process where we start from a universally accepted statement and from that draw logical conclusions. Now, first and foremost, how does this really practically relate to us? Let me give you an example. I want you to put your hands up if you really truly believe that China is a country on planet Earth. Good. We're all sane human beings. I want you to put your hand up if anyone has been to China before. One, two, three. Good. Only three. Let's talk to the rest of you. Have you, since most of us have never been to China before, I would argue now, have you ever eaten Chinese food in China? <laughs> have you spoken to a Chinese person before in China? <laughs> Me and Kaoyang. You know what that means. No? Good. I was talking to myself. It means you're very pretty. <laughs> okay, so we, we have a conviction that China is actually a country on earth, but yet we have an empirically understood, tested, verified if China exists. Now someone would argue, well it's on the map. And you've met a Chinese person before. Well if I said to you, I am a Fufulonian, and I'm from the planet Fufula, would you believe me? Yeah. You're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> also, if I would say to you, here's planet Earth, and there's this country right underneath Australia, and it's called Zigzagawok, all right? And the people from there, they're actually human beings with arms on their back. Would you believe me? Because someone just claimed it? No. So why do we believe that China is actually a country on planet Earth? And this is like the study of epistemology, the study of knowledge. Well, we know it to be true because of this fact called testimony. There's a recurrent reporting in Arabic, it's called mutawatir. There's a recurrent reporting that to claim that the statement that China does not exist, to claim that statement is actually absurd philosophically. This is why C.A.J. Cody in his book, Testimony, a philosophical study, highlights our dependence on this. And he says, many of us have never seen a baby born, nor most of us have examined the circulation of the blood, nor the actual geography of the world, nor any fair sample of the laws of the land. Nor have we made observations that lie behind our knowledge that the lights in the sky are heavenly bodies immensely distinct. So he makes a point, what I'm trying to say now. So if we apply this to the Qur'an, I would argue to reject the Qur'an as a divine miracle is equivalent of rejecting that China is not, is a country. It is equivalent of rejecting that. So let's take the universally accepted statement 
with regards to the Quran. We have some smiles here, but I'm going to philosophically bring you to this conclusion. The universally accepted statement with regards to the Quranic discourse is those best placed to challenge the Quran fail to meet the challenge. That's the underlying assumption and premise. This is why Professor Bruce Lawrence in his book, The Quran and Biography, says, as tangible signs, Quranic verses are expressive of inexhaustible truth. They signify meaning, laid within meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. It's on page 8, by the way. Okay? So let's draw logical conclusions. Firstly, we know the Quran could have come from an Arab, a non-Arab, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, which means peace and blessings be upon him, or God himself. So from this statement, let's work together to find out the best logical conclusion. Well, first and foremost, could it have come from the Arabs? No, because at the time of Revelation, they were Arabic linguists par excellence, and they failed to change the Quran. The best linguist at the time, Walid ibn al muhira he said, by God, this cannot come from a human being. Also, some may argue about today's Arab, but there's a problem here. If we study linguistics, we know Arabic language has suffered something called linguistic degeneration. For instance, how do you say phone in Arabic? Telefon? <laughs> Doesn't even belong in the Arabic language, just elongated the own bit, right? So there's a linguistic degeneration. Okay, what about the second option? Could it happen from a non Arab? Well, this is impossible because the Arabic in the Quran is Arabic, you need to know Arabic. Well, we could safely then go to the next option. Could it have come from the Prophet Muhammad Many oriented to say, well, he was a genius, unique, special. He was a gift to mankind. He transcended everything. So, okay, sit down. I've never had a dog come to my lectures before. <laughs> it's amazing. Okay, good. So where were we? Okay, we were... It couldn't have come from the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, because he was an Arab himself, and all Arabs failed to change the Quran. Also, we know that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, suffered many trials and tribulations during his prophetic career. Many trials and tribulations. For example, his beloved wife passed away. He was stoned by children. He was abused, boycotted, tortured. There was an emotional roller coaster of his 23 year prophetic history. But yet, none of these emotions, none of these emotions are in the Quran itself. And the doctor may agree with me. We have similar backgrounds. If you study psycholinguistics, you would see that it's more reasonable that some parts of people's emotions and character are in the, the text itself. This is why we have theories like grounded theory or discourse analysis. So we know it's Shakespeare because some of Shakespeare's in the text. You can see some of his personality. But the Quran is in a divine voice. It doesn't reflect the emotional trials of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Also, we know that the narrations of the Prophet, also known as Hadith, are in a distinct style to the Quran itself. There was a study done in Egypt that they got normal people and they put statements of prophetic hadiths and statements of Quranic verses and mixed them up and said, tell me which one is which. And all of them knew which one belonged to which category because of the distinct style. So how can, from a psychological perspective, when these verses were revealed instantaneously, actually can be done at the same time as producing his distinct prophetic hadiths? Also, all types of human literature can be imitated if the blueprint of that literature exists or that expression exists. For example, if you look at art, you can imitate art because you have the blueprint of Monet, for example. But we have the blueprint of the Quran in its expressive form, which is the Arabic, yet we cannot produce anything like the Quranic discourse. So from this perspective, we have good reason to believe it came from the divine. Let me go to the third argument, Islamic economics. I would argue the products of secularism, if you want to loosely term it this way, such as capitalism and liberal economic theory, have failed humanity from a global perspective. Because we see 3 billion people in the world live on less, of, less than $2 a day, 1.3 billion people have no access to clean water, 3 billion people have no access to sanitation, and 2 billion people have no access to electricity. 
I would argue in a humble way that Islamic economic theory can actually provide a cogent response to this world problem because capitalism has obviously failed. And the way this is done is by discussing various aspects of Islamic economic theory. For example, Islam has a very unique Islamic macroeconomic theory, a geopolitical model. Because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he said that the mankind, human beings, require just food, shelter, and clothing as limited needs. And there's enough resources for that. For example, certain geopolitical studies said there is 36 billion. There are enough resources to deal with 36 billion people. Now, in contrast to the capitalist model, which is essentially there are too many needs or enough resources, which creates excessive competition. So from this, Islam also addresses an important fact is that we must remove interest. Because, as the Quran says, God has permitted trade and forbidden interest. Because interest restricts investment and it's an impediment to the distribution of wealth. Also, Islamic taxation is much smaller, so it aids the distribution of wealth. There's no income tax. Essentially, it's a 2.5% spiritual tax, which we call zakat, which means more money in the hands of the society. And if we contrast this with the US, for example, according to the National Bureau of Economic Research, it concluded that, more, that the combined federal, state, and local government average tax for most workers is 40% of income. Also, in Islam, we prevent monopolies. As the Quran says, that wealth does not become a commodity between the rich among you. And there's government intervention to prevent the hoarding of wealth because it prevents the distribution of wealth, which is the number one economic problem. And the next point is very significant. People's natural resources are people's wealth. So the oil, gas, fire belongs to the people. So it must be invested back into the people. Because the Prophet, peace and blessing upon him, said, people are partners in three things. Water, pastures and fire, indicating the natural resources. So that means more wealth is injected in society. Finally, we have more stability according to we have more stability according to Islamic economics because issuing money is the duty of the state and it's not free floating. It's pegged on the gold or silver, something substantial. This is why Reginald McKenna, the once British Chancellor of the Exchequer, he said, I am afraid that the ordinary citizen will not like to be told that the banks or Bank of England can create or destroy money. And also, Jay Shelton, in his publication, Money Meltdown, agreed that we have to go back to the gold and silver to create more stability. As he said, I see no escape from the conclusion inherent in the position of the advocates of gold that only a convertible monetary system is sufficiently free from discretion to guarantee that it will achieve price stability. This is the power of the social political model of Islam. This is why in Islamic history, when Islamic values were comprehensively implemented at the time, such as the Ottoman period, the Ottoman Caliphate, in 1507, 58 silver aspirants could buy one gold coin. After 82 years in 1589, one gold coin could cost 62 aspirants. And that's only 7% inflation in 82 years. Look at the stability here. The 7% inflation in some European countries in six months. So my final argument, which is my fourth argument, is that in reality, morality doesn't make any sense in absence of the divine. Because the whole discussion today, if we look at it from a humanist perspective, in my humble opinion, doesn't really have much any value. It's ephemeral, it's empty. Because in absence of God, we don't have an objective anchor, an objective foundation for morality, for objective morality. Because God, if you think about it, brothers, sisters, and friends, is the only concept that transcends human subjectivity. In absence of God, we have two, which the philosophers call ontological foundations, which means foundations for morality. And they include social pressure and evolution. Well, let's take social pressure into consideration. Well, first and foremost, if we accept social pressure as a foundation for objective morality, we have huge problems. Because first and foremost, morals are not objective anymore. They're not binding in that sense. They're just relative and ephemeral. Just like herd morality, in essence. Because it would justify the killing of six million Jews in Nazi Germany. Because there was a social pressure at the time 
that indicated that it's okay to annihilate human beings. Something we all disagree with. Also, if we study social constructionism, if you read the book by Vivian Baer called Social Constructionism, we see there are influential factors in society, such as the politicians, economy itself, that drive society in a certain direction. So to have that as a foundational basis for objective morality means God knows what's going to happen in 50 years time. For example, there's an organization called NAMBLA, the North American Men Lover Boys Association, which are using human rights legislation to legalize 60-year-old men to sleep with four-year-old boys. If social pressure is our anchor for objective morality, then, that, then we should be able to do this. But we can't take social pressure. Look about evolution. What does evolution actually say? Evolution dictates from a moral perspective that we're just accidental byproducts of a lengthy biological process. Our morals have evolved like our teeth, our unwanted hair. That's the reality of the evolutionary paradigm. It justifies that we can have altruism and morality, I agree. But to provide an objective basis for morality, it can't, because our morals are contingent on biological changes. This is why Darwin, he indicated that if we were to evolve like the shark, it would mean it's morally okay to rape women. That's what sharks do. This is why the atheist philosopher of science, Michael Rules, he says, morality is a biological adaptation no less than a hands, feet, and teeth. And he says, nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction. For example, the humanist ethicist, J.L. Mackey, and he was an atheist in his book, Ethics, he said there are no objective morals. So this is relative, pluralistic, herd morality, if you like. So I would argue that in absence of God, we don't have an objective anchor to provide a basis for objective morality. This is why Richard Taylor, the famous ethicist, he said, the modern age, more or less repudiating the idea of a divine lawgiver, has nevertheless tried to retain the ideas of moral right and moral wrong without noticing that in casting God aside, they have also abolished the meaningfulness of right and wrong as well. So let me just summarize the arguments today, brothers, sisters, and friends. My first argument was a cogent case for the existence of God. The second argument was about the divine nature of the Qur'an, the inimitability of the Qur'an using an epistemological argument. Also, I argued that the Islamic social-political model manifested in the form of the Caliphate is something very beneficial in contrast to the product of secularism, such as capitalism and liberal economic theory. And I used Islamic economic as an example to show there's a cogent case for the Islamic worldview in a comprehensive sense. And finally, I discussed that our value judgments, for example, even if Dr. Khalid will come here and say Islam is bad or something's good, from a humanist perspective, they're just subjective and relative. Because if you take good out of the picture, there is no conceptual anchor that transcends human subjectivity. Therefore, these value claims are not objective in nature. Brothers and friends, as I said in the beginning, we should have a conversation today. It's not a debate. So we could connect with each other as human beings. And in the words of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he said, the cure to ignorance is to ask and learn, and in this light, let's proceed. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I feel very sort of uh, not only honored, but it's such a new experience because I've never been, I've spoken many times to medical students, to doctors, to psychiatrists, I've talked to many sort of psychotherapists, I've talked to many humanists. But this was the first opportunity when Shaima <coughs> invited me on behalf of Muslim Students Association. So in the beginning I told her, I said, you know, why are you inviting me? There are many atheists, free thinkers in Canada. And she said, no, we want you. I said, why? I, was, I said, I'm not. I said, uh, <coughs> Brother Hamza is a scholar. He's a, very learned man and he's been all over the world. So why are you inviting me to, 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 to have any debate? Because I'm sure uh, he is not sort of in that kind of a uh, situation to, uh, for a person from the Muslim background to have this debate. But he said, no, we want somebody who is from the Muslim background, 
who is a humanist from that background because the debates that he has been doing are people from Christian or Jewish or other backgrounds. So I think her persistence uh, sort of I said, okay, I'll sort of come for a friendly dialogue. Maybe I'll obviously learn something from him or from you people that will be questions. So I think the credit of my coming here goes to Shah and you people. I want to thank you because that is a new experience for me to speak to Muslim students for the first time in the university. So I just want to take a moment. Uh, I think uh, as uh, the format is that because there will be another 15 minutes of dialogue of rebuttal to response to what, uh, what Hamza said. So I'll focus on the thing that I want to say and then let him respond to my questions and then I'll respond to his questions. One thing I agree with him that he feels or he, the sense I got that obviously he feels there are some objective morals, there are some objective truths, there are some objective realities, or there are some absolute realities. That's what he's feeling. And he's correct in perceiving that I do not feel that there are objective truths or objective realities or objective morality. So that is where my situation is, that how did I come to that? So I think to me, my journey is a very personal journey because I believe as a humanist and as a psychotherapist that each individual, each human being has his own truth or her own truth. So there is a personal truth of each human being and that is his or her truth. And we keep on changing that truth every day, every month, every week. And we go from the birth to death. We have that sort of experiences. And that is my... So what I, all I can share with you people is not that what your truth should be or you should follow my truth. All I can say is this is my truth and this truth has evolved over the years or decades. And what were the factors, what were the experiences that I went through that changed my mind. And maybe if any of that connects with you people, maybe that might give you some sense of connecting with that. So, so, so the question today that I'll share my truth has three parts. One is my personal encounters, two or three that I'll share because of the time limitation. <coughs> then I'll share a few philosophical discussions that I came through. And I'll come up with some political discussions that I came across in my, in my sort of life. So that you have some sense of how those things sort of evolved for me. Some of you might know that I grew up in Pakistan in a very Muslim family, Muslim culture, Muslim sort of environment. And that was after 47 because of the multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious environment of India after the breakup of Pakistan, the Pakistan created as the society of Muslims. So in a way it was a monolithic society. Everybody I knew across all around me were Muslims. So what I consider now as a psychotherapist is what I call as a social, cultural and religious conditioning. So I was conditioned that my mother, my father, my grandmother, my everybody said and the things that, uh, that Hamza said, that there is one God, that there are prophets, there are scriptures, there is life after death, there is a certain morality, there is certain sin, certain guilt, all those things, and I bought that. I accepted all those things, and, and gradually I still realized that that has become sort of a, my reality, and it's not my reality. It was a reality of millions of children growing up in Pakistan, or many Muslim countries, that we are socially, culturally, and religiously conditioned. And the thing is that all of our life, if you see how many people change their faith or change, it is very, very minimal. So the conditioning psychologically is so strong in the first 10, 15 years that most of our life we cannot get out of it. So I'm glad that I think uh, sort of my friend, he came out of it, so obviously he questioned and he came to his new truth, different than his old truth, and I came on the other side. So it is where we show that the people who are changing their faith, changing their uh, the, the tradition is gradually now in the last century is increasing. The number of secular humanists in 1900 all over the world was roughly 1%, openly saying we do not believe in organized religion. In 2000, humbly all over the world, roughly went to 15%. In Canada, it is about 20%, 19%, 20%. In the Scandinavian countries, it has gone even above 50%. So you could see in the last couple of centuries, the number of humanist, free thinkers, atheists, agnostic, whatever the name they give, the number of people who are not believing in an organized religion or organized uh, concepts of God have been increasing. So the question is that what is that sort of a shift all over the world? It is a shift from that the people who are religious people who believe in the truth, the ultimate truth, you know, the, the only truth are shifting that maybe the truth is not as clear as demarcated as only as we used to believe. So this was my belief. 
So what happened then, if I grew up in that culture and I accepted all that, now let me share with you three encounters for me. That's the personal part. The first was when I was about 12 years old, I used to live in Peshawar. There is an Eid God where the people come for Eid prayers and twice a year for small Eid and the big Eid they will come. One day I saw these hundreds of people in Eid God, they're praying. So I went to this old man, our religious cleric, our Maulana Sab, I said, why are they praying? It's not Eid. They said, uh, it is, there is a lot of heat, there's no rain. They are praying to have rain. So I said, are you sure this is going to happen? He said, yes, they're going to pray and there will be rain. So as a child, I was curious. One day, two days, five days, ten days, fifteen days, three weeks, there was no rain. So I went back to him, I said, Maulana Sab, there is no rain. He said, you know, these people, these Muslims, they are sinners, they were not honest, they did not pray to God, and because of these bad Muslims, God is punishing them, so that is why there is heat. And that really, that whole sin of, of the concept of hell, the concept of sin, the concept of guilt, really scared me. I was really, really nervous and scared as growing up as 12 or 13 years old. Luckily, I had a teacher in the school that was a science teacher, so I asked him, I said, you know, what, what do you think about the, this rain and sunshine? And I think he said, this is physics and this is astronomy and this is laws of nature. So this rain and sunshine happens according to the nature and no prayers and nothing is going to do. So don't think of these miracles, just believe in laws of nature. So that was the first indication to me that laws of nature as compared to miracles that I used to believe and many people around me or those hundreds of people who believe that you could pray and there would be rain, I said that was the first question mark in my head. The second was when I was 13 in 1965, we had a war, war between Pakistan and India for 17 days. I saw the bombs dropping, there was a blackout, and we would dug the trenches. And I heard for 17 days these Maulanas, these religious people saying it is a holy war, Hindus are our enemies, and uh, you know India is our enemy. And I, the 13-year-old, was quite affected emotionally by all this sort of a sentiments around, and I remember there was a pilot, M.M. Alam, who shot six Indian planes in one minute, and he was given a special award, he was or whatever, and he was the hero. And there were thousands of people like me who made him as a hero, and I can tell you that as a teenager, people talk about, I'm not I'm talking about abstraction, you know, I'm not talking about the philosophical thing, this was very personal. So I remember the time, for four or five years, there was a time in my life, I really believed in that holy war, I really believed in that jihad, I really believed that Hindus and atheists, non-believers were my enemies, I really believed that I could give my life for that cause, for that jihad, and I really believed that I could take a life. Because if it is holy war, and this is against non-Muslims, that I could do that. And now I look back and I feel honestly, I'm making a confession, that I really feel embarrassed and I really feel ashamed that how could I believe for a number of years that I could kill other people on the name of religion or God or that concept of Islam and feel good about it. Now I feel bad, but I, I'm lucky that I was did not stay in that phase. So how did I change? That is the question. So to me, the writers, the poets, the intellectuals, if some of you know the, 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 the Pakistani or Indian, Indian uh, sort of literature. There was one writer for me, Saadat Asan Minto, a short story writer. And there was one line, and he said, why do you say that 100 Muslims will go to heaven and 100 Hindus will go to hell? Why don't you say that we lost 200 precious human lives? That was the first time a writer said to me that human beings are human beings first, then Hindus are Muslims, the Christians are Jews. That stayed with me. I didn't know that he was a humanist writer, but now I look back and I think that was the one person. Then I go to medical school, and then some of you, if you know the history, there was this group, small group, there are many of them in, in Toronto, Ahmadis, they were declared non-Muslims, and the thing that happened to them, they were our friends, there was so much persecution, there was so much animosity, the garbage was thrown in, on their doorsteps, and I really, it was really so upsetting, I felt that this kind of a Muslim, and this kind of Islam, and this kind of a thing, I, I, I got sort of really disillusioned. The Shias, the Sunnis, the Ahmadis, the Barabis, the sects, and it was very, it was violent. It was it not just talking, we are having a friendly dialogue here. It is not friendly dialogue. It is, if you are not according to my sect, then your life is okay and we can take that. I was really, really, sort of really disillusioned. But then what happened? This is where my personal story ends. The philosophical story was, but this is you, these are the Muslims. This is not Islam. That's the biggest argument. This is not Islam. They're bad Muslims. They're not following Islam. They're not following Quran. If they follow the true Islam, the true Quran, the true tradition, they will not be doing all this. They're not good Muslims, but they're not Muslims at all. 
So somebody said to me, Mr. Sahel, don't be so emotional, don't be so teenager, like don't get all sentimental, go and study Quran, go and study history of Islam, you will change your mind. So I was really serious because this was a matter of death. So I tell you, I sat down, I took the Holy Quran, obviously I didn't know the Arabic, so I took the translations of the scholars, Abu Ala Madudi, Ghulam Ahmed Parvez, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, Allama Muhammad Iqbal, Pickthal, English one. I had these five translations. I went honestly for five years from the first words to the last words. And I tell you honestly, if you do that, there was not a single concept, not a single idea, not a single philosophy that they all five agreed. Not a single one. Let me give you three examples just to make a point. Abu Ala Madudi was against evolution. He said, this is all hogwash. This Darwin, he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. He's full of, you know, ABC. <laughs> the other, Abu Kalam Azad, the scholar, said, no. The Quran and evolution, there's no contradiction. And I'll give you one word. There's one expression in Quran, nafsun wahida. Nafsun wahida, everybody else translates as Adam. Abu Kalam Azad translated, there's an English word I remember in his, in his Quranic interpretation, unicellular organism. And he said it's from amoeba. And he said in Quran it says it started with water and the blood clot started to look like a fish. So he said there is no contradiction. So one scholar says there is a contradiction and one says there is not. The other one was malaika. Everybody else translated that as farishte, as angels. Ulam Ahmed Parvez says no, laws of nature. So the same expression malaika is laws of nature or is it the, the angels that are sort of the miracles. Muhammad Iqbal says in his six lectures that he gave, that are very famous six lectures of reconstruction of religious thought in Islam, says hell and heaven are states, not places. States of mind, states of existence, metaphorical. And Adam and Eve is not a story of one in heaven who came out of that because they ate from the tree, that Adam and Eve is a story of man and woman. So the question was that after five years of my study, I realized that there's basically two interpretations of Quran. Whether it's word of God or not, obviously there is a book, you know, one can believe it is divine and one says it is other Muhammad. Whoever, whatever the interpretation, how it came, but we have a book and one billion people believe in that, want to follow it. The question is that there are multiple different contradictory interpretations. Half of them are doing literal interpretations and half of them are metaphorical. So the question is, when you are putting into action, it is not a theory that, you know, the, what are you going to do with, with that Quran? What are you going to do with that principle? How are you going to implement that? So mean, when you are implementing that, are you going to follow the Ahmadis? Are you going to follow the Parvezis? Are you going to follow the Devandis or the Brahmis? Which Quranic interpretation are you going to follow? So the laws, if we are stating, you know, I am very practical. I am, you know, in Pakistan, we want to make a constitution. So who, which Islamic state, Islamic State of Pakistan, Islamic Republic of Pakistan, how are we going to make the laws? Which, which sect of, because each one of them says, this is the right interpretation, this is the right Islam, so the question is, are you have one wife or four wives? Are you going to cut the head or not cut the head? What are you going to do with lesbians and gays? What are you going to do if somebody is drinking? What somebody does if he doesn't pray? So the question is, there's not an abstract thought. Islam in action, Muslims in action, we have to know which interpretation. So I, all I can say is, my ignorance and my awareness that I came out of that, that I could not interpret. I'm not a scholar, I'm not a Quranic scholar, you know, maybe other people are. So for me and the people around me, we realize that if we as secular humanists or that we cannot, this Quranic interpretation from a psychological or philosophical point of view might be a great book like other holy books, but when you're putting into action, how, how, how are we going to interpret that? The second was Islamic history. So I went back. So there are 1500 years or 1400 years. So then I realized with my limited knowledge, that there is a Sufi tradition, there's a spiritual Islam, and people like Radia Basri and all that follow the Sufi tradition. There's one, and that was partly influenced by Christian uh, 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 sainthood or Kabbalist or Hindu uh, sp spiritual people. Then there was a philosophical tradition. There, Muslim, Muslim history has a great tradition of Muslim scholars, and I, I have a lot of respect for them. One of them was Abi Sina. There was Pundi, there was Razi. Abi Sina, I, I worked in Iran in front of his tomb. Abi Sina was a, is a medicine man. His canon of medicine, his medical uh, book on medicine was for 600 years, textbook in the West. But that was the time that Muslim scholars were in touch with the Greek philosophers and they were open. So then, what happened? After that, how did the, the, the enlightened Islam turn into this fundamentalist and militant and whatever? That is the question. So to me, 
one of the questions is that about 700 years ago, you know, that there was this transition. And the, what the transition was, let me quote you from a scholar in Pakistan, he's still alive, Pervez Hudbai, in his book, Islam and Science, he says, and I'll, I quote, about 700 years ago, Islamic civilization almost completely lost the will and ability to do science. Since that time, apart from attempts during the Ottoman period and in Muhammad Ali's Egypt, there have been no significant efforts at recovery. Many Muslims acknowledge and express profound regret at this fact. Indeed, this is the major preoccupation of the modernist faction of Islam. But most traditionalists feel no regret. In fact, many welcome this loss because in their view, keeping a distance from science helps preserve Islam from corrupting secular influences. So many of them are happy. They don't want science. They don't want philosophy because in their... Now obviously this is one school of thought, but that school of thought is very dominant. It's getting more more influence in the Muslim world. And one of the people that quote is the Ghazali, Abu, Abu Hamid Ghazali. And I let me quote off one of the quotations from, from Islam and science. Ghazali believed, and I quote Perez Hudbai, there are two drawbacks with rise from... There are two drawbacks that arise from mathematics. This is a Ghazali friend. The first is that every student of mathematics admires its precision and the clarity of its demonstrations. This leads him to believe in the philosophers and to think this all their sciences resemble this one in clarity. Further, he has already heard the accounts on everybody's lips of their disbelief, the denial of God's attributes, and their contempt for truth. He becomes an unbeliever merely in accepting them as authorities. So finally, in the Muslim world, about 700 years ago, there were two roads for the Muslims. One was of reason, science, psychology, philosophy, and one was of revelation, so that you follow the revelation. And so what happened? The difference between the Muslim world and the Christian world. In the Christian world, in the West, the philosophy, the science, the psychology won. And God, if you people heard of Nietzsche's Thus spoke Zaratustra that God is dead and all that. So they put religion and science in the back, uh, on God in the background and brought philosophy and psychology in the forefront. In the Muslim world, it was the opposite. The science, the psychology, philosophy for the last 700 years has been in the background. We have not produced the Avicinas and the, the Razis and you know all that for seven, eight, nine hundred years. And I'll quote not a Muslim scholar, but Octavio Paz, a Mexican Nobel laureate. And he says, Islam has also experienced difficulties similar to those Christianity has undergone. Finding it impossible to discover any rational or philosophical ground for behalf in a single God, Abu Hamid Ghazali wrote his Incoherence of Philosophy. A century later, Everos answers with his Incoherence of Incoherence. For Muslims too, the battle between God and philosophy was a fight to the death. In this instance, God won, and Muslim Nietzsche might have written, philosophy is dead, we liked it, killed it together, you killed it, and I killed it. This is an overall, and I know, that I think our friend, our scholar is a very, uh, sort of a very philosophical mind, and he might agree with philosophy and you know, psychology and reasoning, Islam and religion, but the predominant field, we are not individuals, there are some individuals like Ulam Ahmed Parvez who embrace uh, science and science. But the predominant theme of the Muslim world in the last 800 years has gone away from science and psychology towards revelation, towards God, towards scripture, and we follow that in the said. So the question is, what is the opposite? So we talk about the secular humanism. So that, when I started to study that, I realized that the tradition in China was of Confucius, in Greece was Socrates, and in India was Buddha. So what did Buddha say? Let me quote, just to give you the essence of the secular way of thinking. Believe nothing just because a so-called wise person said it. Believe nothing just because a belief is generally held. Believe nothing just because it is said in ancient books. Believe nothing just because it is said to be of divine origin. Believe nothing just because someone else believes it. Believe only what you yourself test and judge to be true. So your own experience. Buddha says your own experience is the best teacher. And if you have experienced whatever you experience, spiritual truth, religious truth, that is your truth. You know, the question is what that truth has to do with the rest of the world. So I think in the last 200 years, the question now is between the revealed truth in the scriptures and the scientific truth that we have, that is a question, which are we going to follow? And I feel as a secular humanist that we are trying to understand 
the world without God, without scriptures, without prophets, can we understand with our common understanding? So what, what do we have? We have biologists who tell us the genetic, how do you, how do you uh, have genetic problems? You know, the child problem. The psychologist like Freud and all that tells us how to deal with emotional problem that I practice every day. Then there are sociologists who tell us how to do the socioeconomic theories and all that, and the physicists about the world. So the question is, can we understand this universe? Can we understand human beings without God, without scriptures, without divine revelation? Can we as human beings understand that? So that is obviously open to, to all of us. The third argument is the political. The political is how we come across to the Muslim world. So the, obviously 700 years ago, 1000 years ago, 1400 years ago, let's talk about the last 50 years, the last century. In the last century, uh, Hamza said, where did we go? Did we go to China? Let me tell you four countries that I, in Pakistan I lived, I went to Afghanistan, where obviously you know Mullah Omar and Osama, what he did. I went to Iran, where Khomeini did to, to, as, as a revolution. And we went to Saudi Arabia, where you know. So the four countries, the Muslim countries of the 20th century, you know, are expressing a certain form. So the question again is, they are not good Muslims, if they follow the right Islam. The question is, the fruits and the trees are having some kind of a relationship. At the moment, whatever the original principles were, that the people who are following that in the world are showing a, what we call as a, 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 a states that are specially concerned for women and minorities. Because in those uh, situations, women and minorities and then children are really affected. I saw Ziyal Haq's regime in Pakistan where he, it's not a very, very rare incident, where Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto was, was democratically elected prime minister, he was hanged and you saw Benazir Bhutto, his daughter was, 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 was killed. So every day, the country that I am from, every day this speech, I, that was one of the people that came here, because you could not have this kind of debate at this moment in Pakistan. And let me quote you one example of, if you go to Wikipedia, one of the scholars, Muslim scholars, all of you know, Abul Alam al let me quote you, but the translation. Islam wishes to destroy all states and governments anywhere on the face of earth which are opposed to the ideology and program of Islam, regardless of the country of the nation which rules it. The purpose of Islam is to set up a state on the basis of its own ideology and program, regardless of which nation assumes the role. The same way, uh, the ideological leader Sayyid Qutb says, it is the nature of Islam to dominate, not to be dominated, to impose its laws on other nations, and to extend its power to the entire planet. The question is, this is what in the West, in the, in the civilized world, in the modern world, we are worried. The people, why are concerned? I, I fully agree that there are a lot of Peace-loving, my, my friends, peace-loving Muslims, they are people individually who are very noble and very compassionate, very humanistic. And to me as a secular humanist, we should respect that. I should respect every faith and every religion. The question here that is alarming for us as secular humanists is that what if this minority who are struggling, who are with that their fundamentalist interpretation, when they get into power, when they are taking hold of the social, the political, especially in Pakistan, in Saudi Arabia, now you can see the world, you know, the Libya, the whole Middle East is at a state. So for, for one billion Muslims, I think the question now is that what in the West we say, we say what about the, the secular countries as compared to the Muslim countries. Yeah, Canada is one secular country, Norway is another, Denmark is another, Sweden, these are the countries that I visited. That where you can say that as, as if there is any other constitution, it is the international human rights. All citizens of the, that state, all citizens of that country should have equal rights, irrespective of race, class, religion, whatever the ethnic background. So, so the question here is, I feel that growing up in that, and I'm very compassionate with the, with the Muslim cause, and I feel after 9-11, they have been, I, I am very sympathetic that there has been backlash, and there has been a lot of difficulties, but the question is that one billion Muslims as a totality, are we following the violent interpretation, the, the fundamentalist interpretation of, of Islam, or the peaceful, enlightened uh, uh, interpretation of Islam, or a secular humanism. I feel, if I've been very honest with Brother Hamza, I don't think, basically, I think,
that we are not on the, in a way we are opposite, we are not in the opposite. I think I feel that he's a very enlightened Muslim. He's not the one that who wants to have this jihad and feel in the ABCD. That was my interpretation. I feel that the, the struggle is for, for spiritual uh, Muslims, for enlightened Muslims, for peace-loving Muslims, and the secular humanists to have a, some kind of a, a working together so that we create states anywhere in the world where human rights are respected, where children are respected, where women are respected, where minorities are respected, where we have a peaceful world where human rights, human beings as a human being are respected. That to me is in one world, and to me that we, I am a secular humanist, but I can tell you, I have a lot of respect for religious humanists, I have a lot of respect for spiritual humanists. I'll give you one example. The example is, I went to South Africa, in South Africa, religious humanist Desmond Tutu and secular humanist Nelson Mandela. They worked together, he was inside the church, he was outside the church, he was inside the jail, he was outside the jail, because they wanted to liberate blacks from the domination. So I think any people who are working together for the, the liberation of the people, for the liberation of the society, they should work together. It doesn't matter the ideological difference. So if you have a common goal, then I think we can come together. Otherwise, we have philosophical differences, and I think we enjoy the differences. But the point is, I'm a very practical person. In the state we are going to create, individually, I have no problem. Anybody can have any faith. But as a state, are we going to have an Islamic theocratic state? Because Pakistan became Islamic Republic of Pakistan, and you know all these laws, the blasphemy law and all that. My family did it. So every day I'm scared because somebody can say something and you're nervous. Or we want to create a state like Canada where we can have a dialogue, we can agree to disagree in a respectful way, shamil, serve it nicely, have an open mind. If you can open mind, then I think it's an enlightened the religious people or secular people. But when it comes to a, some kind of a perversion or domination, that is where the tension gets so, the anger, the violence, the bitterness, and that is just my, as a person, I am not representing any organization. I don't know the ultimate truth, the, the, the whole truth. This is my truth or my wish that we, the 21st century, we are so enlightened and we have so much resources that we can create together a peaceful world. And I agree there are enough resources, whether it's a Muslim state or a secular state, there are enough resources. And whether it's a capitalism or you know, whatever it is, I don't know, it's a secular thing. But it would, would be... It, there could be atheist state, there could be capitalist state, there may not be humanist state. There are, I believe they are not associated. In the humanist mindset is human beings are more important, their wellness, their well-being and their prosperity, their peace is more important than any ideology, any philosophy or any matter. That is in a nutshell, I feel, and as a secular humanist, I, I respect religious people, spiritual people, secular people, and that to me is my opinion. So thank you very much for, for my... <laughs> They don't hold any value philosophically. They're ephemeral. They don't have any meaning from an objective sense. But also, I think it's very dangerous as well because it's, it's contradictory, I think. Maybe you could discuss this with me because secular or liberal capitalist values, they're actually propagated in a political environment in a way that they're binding and objective. For example, if you read the book by Professor Chave from London School of Economics called The Liberal Project in Human Rights, he says liberalism Secular liberalism is actually wants to enforce its view on human rights to the whole humanity. That's why he discusses that the UN is a project which is significantly liberal and he has to enforce its view via various strategies to enforce a certain conception of human rights. And he assumes them to be universal. That's why various political philosophers say secularism and liberalism have adopted an ideological hegemony. Because they think they have the absolute truth and they are the yardstick. Also, from a humanist perspective, I think it's incoherent to say that you're, you don't believe in objective morals. Because if you go to the British Humanist Association, which is a main kind of website and literary database for humanist thought, the claim is you can live good and better lives without God or religion. But the word good and better, are you using it in a relative sense or an objective sense? If it's an objective sense, well, we said you need God as an objective anchor. If it's a relative sense, then does it carry any meaning? As I discussed before. Also, the claim was that Muslim society is very monolithic. He quoted Pakistan, it's just for Muslims. This is actually not true because we need to educate ourselves here because the Islamic system manifested in the Caliphate or the Khilafah, or whatever you want to call it, is actually a system for humanity. This is why we have an amazing model with regards to minorities. This is why the Jews in history, when Islamic values were implemented comprehensively in Europe, they used to call people to the Islamic political model. For example, we have a letter 
in Philip Max's book, Constantinople, in 1453, saying, a rabbi is saying, come to the land of the Turks, to the Ottomans, to the Muslims. Also, we have Zayn Zohar, a contemporary Jewish historian. He said, thus, when the Muslims crossed the Straits of Gibraltar, the Jews saw the Muslims as liberators from Christian persecution. We have another Jew, a 19th century historian, Einrich Gratz. He said, the, the Jews live favorably under the Mohammedans, i.e. the Muslims. We have Italian rabbis, David de Pitonoro, for example, he traveled to Baghdad and said exactly the same thing. So the issue is we have to educate each other on the model itself rather seeing a manifestation. Because, for example, if we play that game, if you like, if I said, I live in Britain, I saw liberal secularism to be very evil, would that justify my argument to say it doesn't make sense? No. It's a very subjective, relative, personal argument that doesn't provide reasons why I have rejected a particular ideology. Because I could quote 160 rapes every day in Britain, 25,000 rapes every day in France. According to Amnesty International UK, 74% of all men will call the police with regards to a sick dog on the road, but only 50% will call the police if there was a battered woman on the road. Yeah, I could use these arguments, but I think it's unfair. It's not philosophically sound to bring them because we can pick and choose certain realities and certain dirty manifestations of particular ideas. When it goes to minorities, see, the Prophet Muhammad said in an authentic narration that whoever harms a non-Muslim under our political protection is the equivalent of harming the Prophet himself. We saw the furore that happened as a result of the Danish cartoons. Uh, as a result of the degradation of the Prophet hundred people died, embassies were burned. Now imagine if we really follow the values from a political sense, which doesn't exist in the contemporary world, how we would protect the minorities? Something which is not happening in Zionist regime, which is a secular state. Something which is not happening in Europe. The sociologist Tarek Madud, he said there's an anti-Muslim wind blowing across Europe. Only recently in Britain we had this woman who wears a hijab was battered to death, and the doctors couldn't remove the cloth from her broken skull. We could quote these things and say, oh, therefore we shouldn't be secular. But that doesn't mean it's rational. Our discussion today doesn't make more sense. Also, you said about social conditioning. We're just a product of society. See, I believe if we really did read the Quran, it actually transcends this. Because the Quran is a very existential text. It makes us think of our personal reality. It says, who are you as a human being? Are you just a product of society? Are you a product of political pressure? Are you a product of your parenting? And the Quran says, think about these and transcend this. What's the underlying foundations for your particular worldview? This is why the Quran actually says, are you just going to follow your forefathers even if they were wrong? Very profound here. The Quran itself rejects this aspect of social conditioning. Also, you talked about laws of nature. I think your thesis was that there is a dichotomy, there's a conflict between religion and the empirical sciences, or Islam and the empirical sciences. This is actually not true. I, I, to be honest, I think you've misquoted history in many, many different ways. Because if we go to the philosophers of history or the historians of the Western tradition, we go to Miriam Menopel, uh, an Islamic Spain historian. We go to many other historians. For example, the book, The Intellectual Development of Europe. It says that the Western world actually owned so much to the Muslims in the past, when actually, when the caliphate was in place, because it facilitated, it facilitated thinking and progress from the empirical perspective. And the driving forces wasn't Greek philosophy. The driving forces was the Quran itself, because the Quran says, go out into the universe and ponder and reflect and come to conclusions. For example, with medicine, one of the emotional and philosophical driving forces to to find cures, as the Prophet said, every disease has a cure. So seek the cure. Do you see? So it's not a historical accident based on just an alien philosophy. Also, you talked about jihad. Muslims are proud of jihad. There's nothing wrong with jihad. To name your son jihad is a proud, it's something that we, we have proud. We're proud to do that. Because jihad, we believe, is a mercy from the Creator. It's a rahmah. Because we believe from an anthropological perspective, human beings fight. They fought before religion, during religion, and after religion. And Islam came down with an amazing, unique political framework to deal with this reality of human fighting. This is why human fighting, with the Islamic context, actually had an amazing set of rules. Don't kill old people. Don't kill unarmed un combatants. Don't kill trees. Don't poison the wells. Don't kill religious people. Fight those boys that fight you. Don't kill innocents. No collateral damage. 
a very abstract term to define human suffering and human killing. We have all these set of rules that outdate the Geneva Convention. And jihad itself is not an end. We don't believe that we should just kill people. Rather, we believe there's two forms, defensive and progressive. Defensive is in line with UN Charter Article 51. Every individual, any collective has a right to defend itself. And we have a progressive form, which essentially is, and it's manifested with an Islamic state, which one doesn't exist today, to actually bring people to justice. To show the justice and harmony of the world. Just like what Bush did. Bush did and, and blamed with his liberal interventionism. You know, hiding these terms under the banner of secular humanism. You know? But as we know, it's just for money. And God knows what's going to happen in Libya soon. God knows what's going to happen. They're using it as a pretext to obviously save the oil because the oil prices in Europe are increasing. We see these things happen. We see the carpet bombing and the annihilation of human beings in Fallujah. We're using white phosphorus. The Zionist regime secular regime planted one million bomblets in an area in southern Lebanon which only 600,000 people lived. This is not the result of jihad. Jihad is to implement the justice of Islam, to actually show to humanity we want you to live a great life and it's based on love in a way. Because the Prophet Muhammad said you're not a true believer unless you love for others what you love for yourself. So we want justice and harmony for people. We're going to give that. And sometimes when diplomacy fails, we need to deal with the situation, just like secular liberal regimes do all the time. Significantly, what we have to understand is that the results of jihad have been very positive. The results. Jews and Christians used to fight with the Muslims against the Crusaders. The minorities used to fight with the Muslim state against incoming attacks, which were almost imperial and colonial in nature. But Islam doesn't have that. That's why it doesn't take the resources of the people. Well, it just says, have this system, which is an amazing, profound system. As eloquently the Quran says, what is the matter with you? They don't fight for the oppressed people who are calling and saying, remove us from this oppression. And that's the reality of jihad. It's not an end. It's not to do bloodshed. Rather, it's just like a political mechanism. It's a foreign policy of an Islamic state, just like any ideology, like liberalism, secularism, or any other ideology, has in order to protect its boundaries, which is an inherent human right, and also to deal with human suffering. And we believe that the worst human suffering is to have an unjust model. Also, um, I think the professor's, the doctor's disillusionment was as a result of a particular political environment. Because we can see Pakistan has not implemented, if we go to the constitution, many of these constitutions borrow outdated uh, British colonial constitution. If you go to the country of Bangladesh, for example, we see exactly the same thing. So these are not the direct products of political Islam or holistic Islam. Also about the different interpretations of the Quran. This is a, a bit of a fallacy because you know when we're pointing a finger, usually three fingers point back, right? Because look, when we look at scripture, books, and we look at the Quran, the Quran is not just a spiritual book, it's a legal book that requires rules of interpretation, and there is a scope of interpretation. So we have a scope of interpretation, which we believe is the mercy from Islam. It shows the dynamic nature of the Quranic text. Secular law has the same thing. If you go to Britain, you have secular UK statute law. And what do you have? If you study law, you have four rules of interpretation. The mischief rule, the golden rule, the purposive rule, and the literal rule. And these are tools to extract law from the statute. And you come with different opinions. That's the nature of a legal text, of a legal book. So to use that as an argument, I think, is, is, is slightly almost fallacious. Also, you know, there's an assumption that science is a secular product. No, science is a product of a of an ideology implemented in state form with the right resources. This is why you had it in communism. This is why you had it in a totalitarian regime. This is why that Korea, they developed nuclear weapons. This is why you have it in the West too. It's not a secular product. We can't have our cake and eat it from this perspective. There's no monopoly on science belonging to anyone. But we would argue our driving forces belong to the tradition itself because the Quran is a very unique book that tells you to think. He uses the word, for example, يتفكرون, which means for those who reflect, for those who ponder. It's a very profound book that way. There's no blind faith here. So this is the, the interesting, I think it was like almost a selective analysis of the Islamic tradition. Um, and also with regards to the Islamic State. 
But what's wrong with having an Islamic state? We'll have a great economic stability, we'll, we'll have harmony, we'll have peace. What, what are wrong with these things? And the method for achieving them in Islamic state is based on cohesive values. We're not living in a liberal humanist model. Because if you study political theory, if you want to get into politics, we'll see that if you go to the liberal theorists like Will Kimlick and many others, they say liberalism must have this neutrality. It doesn't have a conception of the good life. It must use competing value structures in particular societies they fight against each other intellectually or socially to compete which values are first. So you can have an excessive individualist culture. So the product of liberal humanism, in my opinion, is a dangerous product. If you read the Children's Society's report that was published in 2009 in Britain, it said excessive individualism, which is the philosophical premise of liberalism and humanism, has created suffering for our children. There's no community anymore. And if you look at the statistics, for instance, this excessive individualism has produced six-year-olds defining themselves by the length of their skirt. It's not a mad wonder saying this. This is key psycholo psychologists, if we, if we, if we want to be a bit more far with regards to this. We see 160 rapes every day. We see one in four women do victims of domestic violence. You know, we live in a problem, problematic world. Social fragmentation decay is one of the hallmarks of the 21st century with regards to Britain and America and many other European countries because of excessive individualism, which provides the premise for secularism and liberal humanism. So I'm waiting for a positive case for the, for the humanist worldview, and one that is based on reason and logic rather than a sociological, this is what I feel, because it is discussions about what makes more sense. Thank you very much for listening. I think we started our dialogue with uh, Hamza saying that he has objective sort of proof. Quran is an objective, objective book, and he feels that. Objective morality could only come through God. You cannot have objective morality. And my premise is that even if you have a book, when it is interpreted, it becomes subjective. That is the basic question. Now the problem, the difference is that in a secular environment, we agree that the focus of human progress are human beings. So when I am in a relationship with a friend, I and him, I and her decide what is good for us. If we are a family, we decide ourselves. Human beings are the focus. When we are a community, we decide among ourselves, the city council or wherever. So we agree that as human conditions change, we as human beings, as intelligent, wise human beings, collectively, will decide what is best for us. So something might be good for London, Ontario, might not be good for London, England. Something in Whitby may not be good for Ajax or somebody. That is the premise. The difference, I think, the problem is when it becomes from God, when it comes from scriptures, it has an authority. So the question is, when in Pakistan, when we say, when we say the secular laws of the British and all that has been changed when the Islamic Republic of Pakistan came, so now in Pakistan we cannot make a new law because if it is in conflict with God or Quran or Islam. So the question now is, who is going to interpret? Which Quran and which Islam? So that to me is, so when you say the authority, so every person who has an interpretation of Quran brings Quran or scripture and says this is authority. The other person says it is not. There was a statistics done in 1971 that find one religious scholar in Pakistan who has not been considered a blasphemous or kafir or murtad or whatever by the others. So they could not come up with one Muslim scholar, one interpretation that we all agree. So to me, whether we agree on an objective book or God or scripture, still some human being is going to interpret that so it becomes subjective, you know, because but Brother Hamza's interpretation might be the best one. But there might be 999 who doesn't agree with him. He thinks he's too liberal or too this or too this. So the question is, there is no way I feel as for that kind of a objective consensus as been in, in the Muslim world at, at the moment. The second thing is, some of them we call the secular thing that he is sort of expressing. I feel it is not just Islamic or Muslim. Some Muslims who are fundamentalists, there are Christian fundamentalists. So Bush might be the president of the United States, but I thought 
in my wise, he was a Christian fundamentalist. He wanted to go and change the world and, and fought with the Muslim world. There are Jewish fundamentalists, there are Hindu fundamentalists. So every religious group has small group. So Gandhi was not killed by Muslim. Gandhi was killed by an extremist Hindu. Yitzhak Rabin was killed by an extremist Jew. Martin Luther King was attacked by an extremist Christian. So the question is, it is not just about Islam or this about it is any religion, any ideology. To me, even I consider that even secular ideology, there is ideology, even if you are a communist and you are, you know, and you want to create this uh, this communist revolution, so you go and want to kill people, then that to me is not humanist. You want to be communist, but you're not a humanist. The question is, is human decency, integrity, respect come at the center of it? Whatever you justify. So to me, it is not just about Muslim. It is any religious doctrine as a minority. Who, so when I go a step further, it is about, let's suppose we are talking about everything about interpretation of Quran. Science might be, he's, he's, he's saying that it could be come through his Quran. The question to me is that if all the solutions are there, my challenge to any Muslim scholar today, including uh, Brother Hamza, is can you find, go to Quran and find us the treatment of cancer, find a treatment of uh, Parkinson's, find a treatment of schizophrenia, but the question is, after the secular scientists who never read Quran, when they come up with a scientific discovery, somebody says, you know, if they say, let's suppose that cancer is treated by, let's suppose, dates. So then they go back and say, in such and such words, Quran said, you should eat dates, dates are good for you. That is what. And the question is, let's go with all the answers there, let's go and find out now. We don't have to wait 100 years. That is my feeling that most of the scientific discoveries are done by people who never read Quran, that most of them are not Muslims, that some of them are not even, even believers. That is the secular tradition of Islam. Darwin, Marx, Freud, all these people, they didn't believe. So this is what we are saying. That is why it is a secular tradition, because they did not go to the scriptures. And I think the, the last point I want to make about that is that Brother Hamza, I think, is talking about either, a, when he, he called it a philosophical, I call it an abstract a theoretical. I want to come to the 21st century today, what is the problems Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Canada is facing, you people, the Muslim students are facing, that is the reality. And the question is, how an Islamic interpretation and how a secular interpretation of those problems of today, that to me is the feeling, that if there is a, an agreement of, of a peaceful society, the question is how we want to implement it. We say as a secular people that democracy is a source. That means democracy is not just in the constitution, democracy is not just election, democracy is the idea that a dialogue, two people, two communities, two families, they should come together and have a meaningful dialogue, that is democracy, in a peaceful way we resolve over conflict. So the peaceful resolution to me is a secular thing, when you bring the scriptures, then it is an offer, you know, one believes in the scriptures and the other doesn't. So we cannot agree on any scripture, it doesn't have to be Quran. And I have a lot of respect, so I'm not saying anything against Quran. I think Quran has a lot of wisdom, I learned a lot myself and I still learn from that, from the Torah, from Bible, from Gita, all holy books, I think they're all part of human tradition. I, as a humanist, feel that I have inherited all the wisdom from any holy book or any tradition, but the question is, what are we going to use today? The books that were holy book that was written 1,000, 2,500 years ago, how much is that relevance and who is going to interpret? That is the question. So there might be wisdom, but who is going to interpret that for us and how are we going to get the consensus? So in democracy, yes, it is a fluid thing. We agree that the people are going to decide for themselves what is best for them and we respect that. And if they make a flaw, then after 10 years, 20 years, they, they reflect on it. They change the laws. And that is a fluid thing because life changes. You know, a family when you have a small child, two months old, that's a different family. As a psychotherapist, you know. When that child is two years old, you change how you know, discipline. When he's 12 years old, he's a teenager and he's sort of a, you know, a, a challenging the parents, you have a different way. So life is evolving. And as a secular humanist, I feel that as a changing philosophy, changing lifestyle, we need to keep our minds open. We should consult each other. We are wise enough to say to each other, what is our problem and let us discuss it. If you go to the scriptures, if you go to the uh, God and religion and have that ultimate authority to God and scriptures, then the question is, who? That, that is my fundamental question. Who is going to interpret Quran for us? Who is the authority? Because my simple understanding is that at this time, in the Muslim world, in one billion people, if Brother Hamza can tell me one person or one organization that will be agreed upon in Pakistan or Saudi Arabia and we follow that, I will, I will consider that seriously.
But my understanding is that it is not only the difference of opinion, it's not only the conflict, it's a very violent conflict. So we see that every day. So it is, you know, it is it is a, the reality on the ground reality, but we are struggling, but we are but we are worried about as, as secular humanists and as human beings. How are we going to solve our social political problem at a personal level? Yeah, I mean if somebody feels wants to have follow a certain tradition, I think that is not the issue. The question is as a social, as a political, as a, as a cultural thing, how are we going to go in the 21st century? That to me is, is, the, is the difference. I feel, obviously it makes sense to me, that if we say that you people are Muslim students, you decide what is best for you. Rather than somebody sitting in Saudi Arabia or in, in Egypt tells you, you are Muslim student, you should do this. This should part comes with religion. Should, you have to, you must, if you don't do that, I feel the concept, one thing if I say, in the religious thing, the concept of hell that I was taught, the concept of, of eternal damnation, that, that not only Islam, but Christianity, the Judaism of hell, I think telling a child, as a psychotherapist, I feel telling a child the concept of hell, where you're going to burn and you're going to be eternally damned and you're sinful, I think that concept, I feel after 100 years, will be as against the children's human rights to teach them about the concept of hell and eternal damnation. It really affects. It affected me and many of the people around me. That you feel so guilty. Half of the therapy that I'm doing in psychotherapy, honestly tell you, it is the people that I treat every day who are feeling guilty, they're anxious, they're depressed, they are insomniac because they're feeling guilty. Not only about Islam, most of my patients are, are, are from the Christian background, but it's the concept of hell, concept of sin, concept of guilt that religion in, induces, and rather than a natural understanding of the human bodies, I did enough strategies to teach children. I was with women. They would not talk about their period, they would not talk about their pregnancy because it was against their upbringing. So educating them, how to love their body, body is something wonderful. Sex is an expression of love and affection. It is not sin and guilt. That connection of, of sex with guilt and sin rather than love and affection and caring and, and, and empathy, that to me is the real problem. What is written in the holy books, I don't know what would written. But that to me as a psychotherapist and as a humanist, I feel that human beings should Enjoy life, should life is to be enjoyed, life is to be cherished, to share rather than the fear and the guilt and the sin and the hell. That concept I, I had great difficulties with and I hope that others reflect on it. So thank you very much and I really enjoyed it. Shakespeare, for instance, 
he did, expressed his language many times in the iambic pentameter. You student of literature, you should must know what yeah. the iambic pentameter is, right? Good. Well, the, well, so therefore, we've produced many times literature and iambic pentameter. Now, Shakespeare's inimitability in great comments is not one of observable structural features, rather it's the, the effect that it has using literary and rhetorical devices. For example, O Romeo, O Romeo, wherefore art thou? O Romeo, deny thy father, deny thy name. If we Islamicize it, if you want, O Abdullah, O Abdullah, deny thy mother, and deny thy tribe. Yeah. So the point I'm trying to, I'm trying to bring it to you, I'm trying to say that if we do study literature, and I because I'm an amateur student of literature, right? If we do study, then we see that all these claims to inimitability are based upon rhetorical and eloquent features, whereas the Quran is based on observable structural features. For example, take, I'll give you an example. Take uh, the form Sajjah. Sajjah means rhyme prose in Arabic, right? And rhyme prose has certain conditions for it. It has a concentrated use of rhetorical devices and it has an accent based with rhythmical pattern. For example, in the English language, it's like a nursery rhyme. Ba, ba, like sheep, have you any wool? Yeah, the accent based upon. This, this is, it's, a, it's an accent based rhythmical pattern. The poetry is more syllable based. For example, one of the rhythmical patterns is called at tawi which goes ba, 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 ba. And it's a technical discussion, but when we apply these known templates, every time we express ourselves in Arabic language, it's in these prose, poetry, or the rhythmical patterns of the al bihar which means the rhythmical patterns of poetry. And when we try to superimpose it on the Quranic text, we're shocked. It's a unique structural form. This is why you should have been attentive to the argument. Also, to quote cutting the hand of the thief, that's a value judgment. It's still in a unique style. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's not inimitable anymore. But let me just mention something here because it's quite an interesting way of making a cartoon of the Quran. Yeah? And we shouldn't caricature as anyone to tradition. Yeah? This is the notion of Sharia law. If we're avid viewers of Fox News, and because that statement was a manifestation of a Fox News mentality, in my opinion, right? And what, what does Fox News do? It portrays Sharia in the following way. You have a woman with a burqa, right? And she's standing right here with a sword right down her cloak. And there's a guy with a beard up to his belly. And there's this poor Canadian kid. He's so happy and he's skinny. And he's in cold. And he's got rags on. And he's running into the supermarket. He steals the cookie. And he goes into the supermarket, gets the cookie. The guy trips him over with his beard. The sister goes, Allah Akbar! Cuts his hand. This is the cartoon that's been portrayed of Islam. And I think, as rational human beings, supposed to sit down and say, cutting a hand of the thief, makes a, a tradition that's been developed over 1400 years into a cartoon. Islam is not Mickey Mouse, right? Because we could do that even with secular law. Let's go to the Dutch Constitution, Article 97. Do you know what it says on Part B? Let me tell you. It says, <laughs> it says on Part B, you must enforce this on non-Dutch citizens. Anyone can just take that and run away with it. And forget about the rest of the liberal humanist values. See, so look, you see, Dutch constitution, they want to force things on people. That would have been a caricature of the Dutch constitution. But let's be nuanced with our tradition. So, with regards to Sharia law particularly, we need to understand that the suitably harsh punishments, which we reject our Baba, we say they're suitably harsh. They're based on a comprehensive social model. That's why when we understand Islam, is we don't understand it from secular eyes. We see it as it sees itself, as a deen. Deen meaning, in Arabic, comprehensive worldview. So we say we have cohesive values in society that we propagate. And another level of the social model of Islam is that the level we have that we prevent, we provide mechanisms in society to prevent crime in the first place. For instance, if you study criminology, the criminologist Clive Holland, he says, we always add new laws, but we never look at the causal factors for crime. Islam goes to the causal factors. This way, Allah gives us a principle in the Quran, do not approach adultery. Give us a principle that whatever leads to haram, bad things, evil things in society, is actually bad itself. So we have mechanisms. In liberal society, you don't have that, because there's no conception of a good life. That's why liberal society isn't like a social mess now in the 21st century. On top of that, we have a very unique justice system. It's not jungle justice. You don't have a mullah in, in, in this, around a lake and just want to like, drown and kill people. It doesn't work that way. We have a judiciary. And we don't follow the liberal model beyond reasonable doubt. We have actually another thing further. It's almost conviction. This is why the Prophet Muhammad said, it's better to release nine men 
that are guilty and inflict punishment on one person. Even when people wanted punishment, they go away. It's, our, our, our philosophy of criminology is more of a deterrent than it should be manifested. But it does get manifested if it follows certain conditions. For example, kind of the thief has approximately 19 conditions. Over puberty, over about 30 pounds, has to be stolen in a private place, in a public place. You should be fed very well, it must be done out of greed, etc, etc, etc. And by the way, when we look at Western tradition, like Professor Van der Aal of Fordham University, he says, look, suitably harsh punishments work if they're a cohesive model. They don't work in America, capital punishment, because there's no cohesive model, it's just liberalism, isn't it? So they work. So there is a Western tradition supporting even the Islamic view. Even um, Professor Noel Feldham of Harvard University says, look, we always make a caricature of the Sharia, of Islamic law. A week for, for a handful of offenses, but we never say the burden of proof that's required to implement this in the first place. So hopefully I've educated you a little bit on the Sharia law. Um, thanks. Okay, um, you, just, you had two questions answered and you need to make some balance. So I'll just uh, uh, um, read a question for Dr. Sohail. And, um, um, okay, I'm assuming that it's to for Dr. Sohail, but it's not written, but I'm assuming. The question reads, you made the claim that fundamental Islam is not correct. If the definition of the fundamentalism is following the authentic ad uh, adherence to a religion, could you please comment about the Sermon of the Mount of, uh, of Muhammad وسلم, All mankind is from Adam and Eve. An Arab is not superior to an un-Arab. Also a white is, has no superiority over a black, nor a black has any superiority over a white, except by piety and doing righteous good deeds. I think that's a very, uh, very interesting whoever said the question. Obviously, it's a very thought out question. Uh, I think what I was even saying to Brother Hamza that one, you're talking about what happened 1500 years ago, or what Muhammad's philosophy was, what he practiced. And I honestly feel it's not, you know, I think some of you feel that as uh, secular humanist and atheist, there's sort of some kind of thing. Uh, against Islam, against I honestly feel, I genuinely feel, many of my atheist or secular friends who criticize me, I genuinely feel a lot of respect for Muhammad. And I think he was a very wise man and he wanted to reform the society. And he had certain principles that he wanted at that time. So that, so, the, so to me, I think those, his lecture, I think it's a very wise, it's one, if I have to pick uh, 10 uh, speeches of the whole world, that is something that to mention. I have a lot of respect. It is a very wise lecture. The other will be Chief Seattle. And if you have not seen in 1856, when uh, the Americans were taking over the native land, Chief Seattle had made a speech 150 years ago. That is a very wise speech. So I think the question to me is bringing from the past to the present. So in the same way, I think Moses was a very, uh, you know, Moses, Abraham, you know, all those Buddha, they were all very wise people. They've all seen the wise people. The question here is, when I'm saying fundamental in the sense that if you're talking literally, yeah, the fundamentals of any religion, so in that way it's not the fundamental. I think the question here is that those people who want to impose, that is in that way, that I feel anybody has a right to have practice whatever they believe. The question comes when a person, whether it's secular, whether it's atheist, whether it's if, if a communist who doesn't believe in God wants to impose communism on me, I'll, I'll fight against that. If somebody wants to impose Islam on me, you practice it, I respect it. My sister is a practicing Muslim, I bring uh, khajurs for her, I offer her prayer mat. I, I took my parents to Saudi Arabia to pray, I respected them, they were honest, sincere. my parents were honest, sincere Muslim, and they respected there's no fight. It is only when you're trying to convert me either personally, knock on my door and want to change me into Islam, or you want to make a law that I as, when I, you see when I got Canadian citizenship, he said to me, doctor said you can become a prime minister in Canada, but you cannot become a prime minister in Pakistan because I did not take the oath on the Quran or the Islam. That is to me is the difference of today when I'm using fundamentalist, whether it's Jew, Christian, atheist, communist, doesn't matter. Fundamental, the person who has in an angry, controlling way tries to control society. And I disagree with the brother that it is not 
that imposition of the liberal law, no, it is a secular point of view is inherent, that if we change, if we disagree, if we want to make a new law, it's the flexibility going towards the future. The difference is the fundamentalist person looks towards the past and the liberal enlightened person looks towards the future. So that to me is, is the question that in the present day, in the future, are we going to, I think, uh, people feel that some of the religious values of Christianity, Judaism, even Islam, are not in the Islamic country? That is the question. How come those values of honesty, integrity, peace is in the secular countries, in the non-Muslim countries? How come because they are practicing the essence of those religions? They have been so much distorted that all I'm saying is it's not that he, you know, that he did give a wrong message. The question is today, in 21st century, we do not have anyone, person or organization, who can say this is the interpretation, whether it's political, economic, religious, whatever, social, that we're going to follow. So it, whether it is a religious country or not, we as human beings, we as brothers and sisters and friends and the community members are going to interpret that. And we feel that the consensus should be the consensus of human beings should be respected rather than a divine authority. That, I think, is the, is the difference between the secular and the religious from that point. Thank you very much. I think that was, that was a very nice question. Um, so, question for Brother Hamza? Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't know about the brother, sorry, I say again, Hamza before. Yesterday I met him first time, and my question is uh, regarding violent conflict. As you talk and you speak about Dr. Palacios about the violent, different opinion. So yesterday I asked him one question, just only one question. He gave me answer. What his answer was? His answer was, don't call me brother. It was first point. Second, your, I belong to I belong to MJ community and belong to Mirza Ghulam Ahmed the Prophet. And second, his, his second answer was. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad died in a toilet. And his third point was, you are a kafir. So my question is, this is your Islam, this is your teaching, the violent conflict, or something you need to comment to the question. Thank you. Very good question. OK. Uh, first and foremost, I don't want to judge your, how you're motivated to say that in a debate that has nothing to do with yesterday, first and foremost. But first and foremost, see, I didn't give you any violence. I was being actually very nice to you because I wanted to make you sure that you're distinct, that you, I understand who you are. Because from my perspective, um, you're not Muslim, you're an Ahmadi. And from your perspective, I'm not a Muslim too. That's the Ahmadi tradition or the view of the rest of the Muslims. So I want to say to you, let's not be disingenuous. I said, let's be honest with each other. So if you took offense, I'd really deeply apologize, okay? Um, and uh, the person that died on the toilet, he actually did die defecating. That was a historical fact, so I didn't say anything that was wrong. If it was offensive, I do apologize. Can you reference this book right yeah. now? Which book is reference? No, I can't reference it now, but I will give it to you. You can have my email, my numbers, or my blog. At least you can reference it, and we can later go to another subject. So in all okay, that, we we'll just need reference. Which book? Then go to Chef Google. <laughs> Go to Chef Google, because it's called a Google now, isn't it? And then you see references. So people know, and we can go. Yeah, that's, that's fair enough, but the point I'm trying to say is. Fundamentally, if I did give you any offense, a huge apologies. My main reason I mentioned those things was to show that if we want to connect with each other as human beings, I don't want to pretend who you are, and you shouldn't pretend who I am, because that's disingenuous. That's actually anti-human. From an Islamic perspective, what we do, because in the Quran it says, all mankind have created in different tribes and nations that you know one another. Now this doesn't mean, based on commonalities, the, the tafsir, the exegesis of this verse means you need to know what makes each other, what makes you distinct. And from the distinction, then you know how to connect with each other as human beings. That's the profound point. So if I did have anything to say, it was based upon my Islamic value to show, look, I need to know who you are, you need to know who I am, then we can have a beautiful common discussion, we could have tea, cha, milk, whatever you want to have, and we can have a discussion. If you find any offense, I really sincerely apologize. But then to extrapolate that it was violent, I think that it won't have a basis. So if, if to say a person is a leader, proper, if your proper diet and violent, it's not violent according to you. Oh, no, but from according to your Islam. No, no, no. And even we don't have a reference right now. Yeah, just so a, according to the Islamic tradition, we don't believe that that gentleman is a question. I'm sorry, brother. I'm sorry. Yeah, it, I'm so it's sorry. Both, in both people, the Brahmin died in a tile. Yeah, it's, it's, it's historical narrative.
Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. So, uh, we only have a few minutes now. This is not a last moment. This is not a last moment. This is your Islam. Thank you. Thank you very much. One last question for Professor Hill. Quick. First of all, thank you very much for this presentation. It's very amazing. You mentioned that your fundamental argument against Islam is so many different interpretations. How do we know which one is correct? Um, and my question to you is, isn't that the same case with, with your own field of psychiatry? For example, you look at schizophrenia. So many different interpretations of what's the ideology. How do we interact with our patients? Um, how do we treat these things? In psychiatry, there's certain things that are um, based on the fundamentals. You know, biopsychosocial model. Certain things that are not well grounded, socioeconomic model. Um, certain concepts are regarding schizophrenia, viral etiology, genetic etiology, whereas other things do not have that same level of evidence. So if you're comfortable accepting that in psychiatry, that there's certain things that are based on objective evidence, there's certain valid opinions and certain opinions that are invalid, why not the same thing about Islam? There's certain things that are grounded in the Quran as understood by the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and his companion, and other things which conflict with that, and therefore we should discard those theories which conflict with what is based on objective evidence? I think that's a very, very important uh, question. I, I agree with you that <clears throat> in science, psychology, psychiatry, we have different theories. Freudian theory, Jungian theory, Ericksonian theory. But we, in our disciplines, welcome that. We think it is a good thing. And no psychoanalyst will go, no Freudian will go to tell the Jungian that you should become Freudian. Or no Ericksonian will go to we so to me the secularism to me is freedom of religion and freedom from religion. So the question is if we agree on that, so I would have no disagreement with you that there are there is a concept, obviously there is a tradition we call Islam. And that has played a very profound role in history. The world uh, owe a lot to that, that tradition. The question is, somewhere in that tradition, that open-minded, that enlight enlightenedness has come to the point in the last century, unfortunately, where as compared to other traditions, some groups of this tradition is creating that where the, the descent that is what I'm saying to the to the world. To me, any person that is any person who says I'm a Muslim, although I'm not consider myself a Muslim, but I anybody who says that I'm a Muslim, in my eyes, I respect him and say Muslim. I don't say it. So that is where the difference between the judgment and the acceptance. I accept you, and if you say you're a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian or Shia or Ahmadiyya, I should respect that. But the question is that when we talk about the fundamentalist thing, nation is not just in Islam, many religious traditions have taken that position that a certain sort of an official, there is an official sort of a dictum, and then that official dictum observed by certain people is tried to impose. So if we accept that there are many interpretations of Islam, of Christianity, of Judaism, you know, but in the religious state it creates a different environment, is that what I'm saying? But in the scientific, the secular world, that difference of opinion, and that is why I came here because we might disagree, but I think it is wonderful that you people here, you know, that I have never heard him, I learned certain things from him. It is a good thing. I think that to me is the only thing that if there are openness, open mindedness and acceptance, and people as you as as far as the all the members of the state, if it is Islamic state, and all the members are considered equal, then I have no problem. But my concern, I think what my brother was saying, that it breaks my heart that my friends in Pakistan, because they are Christians, they are Hindus, or they are Ahmadis, or they are whatever, that the, the social reaction, you know, the brother was very, very honorable to say he, he hurt his, his feeling that he, he apologizes. You know, the question is, that is not the case that the society that I live in. So uh, that is one of the reasons I left. Because for me to go and say there that I'm a secular humanist, I don't believe in certain things, that it, it creates a certain fear and all. So I think to me, I don't have disagreement with you. I agree that any tradition, secular, religious, political, you know, spiritual, every tradition has different followers. The only thing becomes a problematic when legally, socially, politically, 
we take the freedom of expression from the other. I can speak, my voice is better because I have the authority of God of Quran. I feel as a human being, you or anybody has the authority to say your truth, share your voice, and then be an excellent. So I think that is very good. So it's no argument against Muslims and not Islam. Yeah, I think the, what I'm saying is, it's, it's an, so Islam to me is an abstraction, it's a concept. So, so if there were one billion Muslims were gone, then who's, there are many religions that were there, they are gone over there, there's a Tushti and whatever. So the, the religion is known by the people. So I'm a psychiatrist, you don't believe in psychiatry, you, you come to Dr. Sahih. So we meet Muslims. So Muslims are the representation of that tradition. So I don't know whether we are, to me, the Muslim that I grew up in, I felt very uncomfortable and I distanced myself because I could not associate with the people who did the things or who are doing the things. That is my view. Islam in abstraction and Quran in abstraction, no, I think I, so in, in the concept, yes, there is no problem and I can accept that. But to me, the practice of that as, as a secular humanist is very disturbing and very upsetting. And I said, not just with Muslims, it's with Christians, Jews, any people who have that kind of an oppressive, controlling things is very disturbing for the whole of humanity. We, in the 21st century, have come to this realization globally that we should respect every human being and their point of view, even the disagree. That, to me, is in one line. Whether it's inside Islam or outside Islam, we should respect. And just because we are disagree, I have no right to kill him, beat him, hurt him. I said, you know, I respectfully disagree with that. You, you follow your tradition, I follow mine. And let me, even if it's a, it's a, it's a religious thing, let me end with a statement. Most, this is a huge folk tale. Moses was in the jungle and he wanted to eat the food and a, 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 a stranger came. And he said, can, I'm hungry, can I eat with you? So before eating he said, do you believe in God, let's pray. He said, no, I don't believe in God. So Moses said, if you don't believe in God, I don't want to share my food with you. Get, get, get up. So he went. So after five minutes, God said, what did you do? He says, you know, you are the creator, you created him, and he does not believe in you. I can't share my food with him. God said, Moses, how, long, how old do you think he is? He says, about 50 years old. God said, he does not believe in me, I fed him for 50 years. You just have to feed him for one meal and you reject him, go and apologize to the guy. That to me is the essence. So whether you are not a believer, whether you are Jewish or Muslim, as a, as a true Muslim, they should respect all the Christians, you know. I, I know. The thing is, I agree with them. In the Muhammad's time, you know what I learned from Muhammad is one thing that when Muhammad, the present, the life of Muhammad, when the Jews and the Christians tribe people came, he put his chadar, his sheet, and, and he offered him respect. Even here, although we are disagreeing, I waited till Hamza sat down to give him that respect. I might disagree, but I should respect him. He should not leave. He's guest, even I disagree with him. I, he's our guest in Canada, and I over here I'm a uh, I'm a guest, but for, as a Canadian, I'm his host, and I want him to go back from Canada with a good feeling. So I think that feeling is, to me, is the essence. The, the religious rhetoric and the philosophical, you know, we can, uh, we can impress. But as a human being, when I meet with you, do you feel respected by me? That, to me, is the human being. And if it is a part of Islam, that part of Islam, I have no problem with. If that Muslim respects every other person, uh, we have no problem. That's what I've said. That we don't, but that Muslim or that Hindu or that Jew who feels he has the ultimate truth and other people are in the dark and he's going to teach them what, whatever, that is where the problem is. So thank you very much. Actually, the professor of the uh, lecture that was supposed to happen here moved it to another place after giving me some nice words. So I guess we can continue with some questions. <laughs> Since I got some. Okay, so my, my question about the Khalid is, I'm sure you know the Quran very well, and I know how you, you probably read the verse in uh, Surah Al-Quran, it says that there's no compulsion in religion. And I understand that... <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, the, the point I'm trying to make is that Islam actually allows people to believe and practice their own religions, and we have this in history during the 800 AD, during the Spanish Inquisition. We had the Jews, the Christians, and the... And, uh, and, uh, Muslims all living together. And then what ended up happening is that the black Christians that were living with the Muslims and the Jews end up getting attacked by the Christian Crusaders. Now it's not actually my point to bring across um, you know, the wars and the violence that happens between religion, but what I'm trying to actually instill is that you referred to fundamentalism as being a problem, and then you're saying that there are fundamentalists within Islam that are the root cause of the problems in the social disorder that we see today. 
So what I'm trying to suggest is that if the text itself is literally telling you that there's no compulsion in religion, and you're seeing certain people that wish to drive the vehicle of Islam as a bad driver as opposed to a good driver, and the literary text is telling specifically that we do not have a problem with other religions, I'd like you to comment on this and tell me how the fundamental Islam is against peace. I think, as I said from the very beginning, uh, Hamza claims to be Islamic scholar, Christian scholar, you know, I'm saying... <laughs> I never claimed that, sorry, you can't say that. I've never claimed that. So. <laughs> oh, whatever the objective. I think what I'm saying is, I'm sort of sharing with you, not as an authority on humanism, nor as authority of Islam, nor as authority on psychoanalysis. What I'm saying is that for my study of 40 years has brought me, not only me, and many others, that in the scriptures, whether it's Quran or Bible or whatever, the question is, there are arguments in favor. So if I go, like you, that there is no compulsion, then I go that path, and we follow, and then I agree that a group of them, that are said, whether it's Ulam Ahmed Parvail, and many other people will, come to that conclusion and they are open and they are secular, open-minded. But then there are other, in the same way, you see, that is a whole issue. But when there are other things that if you are not a Muslim, if you are a Muslim like me and then you leave, that if you are not following certain traditions, then the state or the, the organization does that. So the question comes, that was feel that if you were the head of the state, you had the political party, you had the religious party, and you followed that. If that was the constitution, la ikraha fi deen, we would have no problem. But there are other verses in the same text, in the interpretation in which there is this coercion, where there is this sort of, that if you are not, so you know, we didn't go into the details. So what do you do with, with women? What do you do with the slaves? What do you do with non believers What do you do with the Israelis? What do you do with Jews? Those are, so when you, as a totality, it, it is very hard, one of the hard texts, that to find a consensus. So what is happening is that people like you who are open-minded and liberal and basically your personality is more peaceful, you pick up those uh, those verses which are very open-minded and liberal and accepting and of other people and not, not imposed. You know? the, the, the problem is that from my point, individually, the belief, conversion. In, in, I was 28 years old, only two groups came to me to convert, either Muslims or Christians. I never saw a Jew trying to convert me, I never saw a Buddhist trying to convert me, I never saw a Hindu trying to convert me, only two groups, individually. The second, as a nation, I agree with that, there is no right for France to go to Algeria. If, if people in Algeria or people in Afghanistan or people in somewhere want to live in a certain way, in cultural tradition, they have their right and I I, that is my feeling. As much as I'm talking about religious fundamentalism, that they're converting at a local level, I'm against Western imperialism. America, France, Britain has no right to go to uh, Libya or go to Pakistan or go to, uh, you know, on the name of uh, whatever, secular humanism or democracy or whatever. That is what I'm saying. As a community, Afghanis and Pakistanis, and they have the right to live their way. We So that is... I feel the, the fundamentalist are controlling individually or collectively or politically when one group is imposing their values on the other, that could be the anti-humanist. So people should have the right. So if